Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with this community of revolutionary saints who are doing the nearly impossible job of walking as embodied femme and women and girls persons who are still struggling for revolution and righteousness. I think in a lot of traditions, to do liberatory work as a person whose body carries the marks of gender and femininity means you wrestle with three important things. Number one, it's erasure. The first battle alone is the knowledge that women's names don't exist. Women's bodies aren't representative. And even when they show up in little bits and scraps of text, we are missing the wholeness, the power, that which makes change possible, the lives of feminine people. But the second thing about looking through our traditions as battered and worn as they are is that when women come to the fore of doing justice out of spirituality, they reframe it as relational. Liberation means something different when works through the hands of mamas and grandmamas and sisters and cousins and friends who have to struggle against their own society's version of who they are, as well as oppression and injustice from the world. And finally, there is something though to be gained and celebrated with thinking about what women represent, even the women who are lifted up as the perfect proverb of wisdom or Mary and all those who are nameless or accused of being the sex worker, the poor person on the street, the woman at the well, that women, no matter where they're going, how long and strong the fight is in our scripture tradition, are doing it with an unwillingness to leave anyone else behind. Solidarity. Solidarity is a womanist and feminist tradition that we refuse to leave as we scrape our way into revolutionary theology. In my tradition, I loved calling it womanist theology, this idea that women from the bottom, women of enslaved ancestry, who are refusing to let the idea that faith and scripture do not belong to them, to emerge and say this is for us because we've known a God that makes it possible to do the impossible. That womanist, that feminist, that gender tradition is one that people have to crawl and claw out of the silences. For the most part of the hundreds and hundreds of images and characters that one sees, even in the Hebrew scriptures and Christian Bibles, less than 10 are speaking women who speak more than one line. Women don't show up and speak to each other. And so we have to parse through stories. We've heard this Proverbs where there's a wisdom woman who is an ideal. She screams with rage when she sees what's wrong with the world, but she also embodies the co-creation of God's joy. And yet there's more to that story. The idea of the Proverbs wisdom woman was written about the same time that the ancient Hebrews were wrestling with their kingship. Who is in charge? Who has power? And for the most part, a man. And as David, who wrote the Psalms, and Solomon, who helped solidify empire, became these heroes on the stage, we can look at these stories and realize that if it weren't for the woman, they wouldn't have been there at all. That the fabled writer of this part of the scriptures, the David tradition, was made, in fact, not just by women, but by women who were victimized, marginalized. We know the kind of names Bathsheba or maybe Abijah. Women who, if they're portrayed at all, are portrayed as sexualized beings or women who were manipulators and manipulated. And yet, when you read through the lines and you see the little scraps here and there, even in the life of this Psalm writer, David and David's child, Solomon, it's a woman who was trafficked 
trafficked into sex slavery, who has the leading role. And there's a woman who was described as dark, married to a foreigner, perhaps she's an immigrant, undocumented, who has this ear of the king of the ancient Israelites. And when the two women get together, when Bathsheba and Abisha get together in that one line, the Bible is not clear enough even to give us an exact transcript of their words, but we know they happened because they put a man there beside them taking notes, Nathan the prophet. And we know that they lifted up the concerns of those who were less than, the concerns of those who were without property, the concerns of those who had been victimized by war and violence as Bathsheba was when her own husband was killed by the state. And together, they were able to do something weird, as we're hearing in politics nowadays. They were able to manipulate what was meant to manipulate and keep women down and to use the roles and terms of being a sex slave or being a concubine and turn the fate of the world. So when I think about the possibilities of women who are doing liberation and revolutionary work to change the world. I'm reminded of Shipra and Pua and Exodus, who were women who were workers in the medical field, who were undocumented, unrecognized, but were able to twist the hands of empire by rescuing the Hebrew babes when they were born. Or when I think about Bathsheba and Abishah, they were able to change the course of all of our religion by putting a child on the throne of Israel who was last in line and not supposed to be there, probably a little darker and a little bit less credential, but they were able to work that together. I think about Ruth and Naomi, people who were marked visibly and physically as ethnically other, and yet were able to integrate themselves and to be the seeds a revolution in Israeli society. Women, especially when they get together, can cook up some incredible things. And that's where I get to the idea that for women, when we do faith and liberation, we do it relationally. We find our power together, be it Pua and Shifra, be it Bathsheba and Abisha, in conversation and talking, and we express that ethic Everywhere we go, women find their way to change stories of erasure by acknowledging that I am someone's sister, someone's sibling, someone's comrade in revolution. We don't make heroes. There are plenty of those in scriptures and in tradition and religion, in politics and in life. But women make true revolutionaries, true comrades by acknowledging. I know your name because God knows my name, that I am one who has been gifted with the ability to have resilience, the ability to find where someone's lacking, the ability to do love in public. And I will find a sister, a sibling, a comrade as well to share this gift of holy wisdom. I bet that's a little bit more about if women had written that description of wisdom in Proverbs would be, or the Mary Magdalene as opposed to the perfect Mary, someone that recognizes what is needed by one's neighbor and where they should find the power, the anger to feel what keeps you up at night, sister, friend, and know that there is a God that does not smile on the idea that anyone should be left behind. The idea that it should be revolutionary, that God does not want people to suffer, even those who don't get named because they're not men. is purely gender womanist thought. And that's what women have done coming out of slavery and oppression for generations, taking and claiming the space, not a perfect space, but a space where they claim as their own. This God that says, I have created you and breathe the breath, a breath that is female gender. When you look at the words of life and you have the power. Women look at each other and community and see power relationally and point to things that are sin. 
It's a sin that there's a place in our country where female mortality is higher because of a person is black and brown or poor than others. It's a sin, say women who go to church and pray and sing once a week, that there are people who have to choose between feeding children and paying medical bills. It's a sin, say women who draw their strength from grandmamas and mamas who sang hymns and clapped that they know that those who want to get an education cannot in this country. They can't afford it. And once they do, the medical debt is interminable. It's a sin. And the idea that pointing that sin out is a revolution, a revolution of women who know what it's like to point to one another and call for change. It's Black August. I'm thinking about women revolutionaries. And we have those wonderful models from the 60s and 70s of folks who are on the front lines, Black Panthers and others who served their terms in jail and in prisons, who lived a revolutionary spirit. And I'm thinking about the very first Black woman ordained, who was ordained out of Philadelphia at a church where, believe it or not, when women were ordained in this Episcopal tradition of mine, there were threats of violence so severe that the head of the church had to get security. And who did they get for security guards? Black Panthers and lesbian bikers. When women want to be heard and known and claim space in the revolutionary era of just saying, I deserve to be here, violence will come at them. And yet, and yet, revolutionaries know to see that violence as a sign that the antibodies know you're onto something. Women revolutionaries right now, when I look around and I see women as theologians living into places where they are changing the world, I look no further than perhaps down in Cancer Alley, where those who are organizing to stop plastics pollution amongst poor black and brown people are mamas and grandmamas. It's the women who are going up against corporations fighting for clean water and clean air and knowing that nobody wants a child that can't breathe. When you look in Dallas, Texas, where there's a mountain of toxic plastic tires in the middle of the city, no one pointed that out but Black women. Women who said this would not be allowed in any other place and refused to do anything other than literally move a mountain. But they find their strength going back every Sunday to church to pray and organize their way to that change. And globally, I am still thinking about going to the last United Nations COP, Council for Environment and Activism, saving the world from climate change, where the good meaning Western European religious folks got together and wanted to claim the way forward is a fossil fuel divestment treaty to reduce less and use less. But it was women from the Southern Hemisphere. African and Asian women who put the brakes on it and said, we will not save this world unless you can ensure that what the Western Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere have can be given to those who still have to go to water pumps and pump their water, to those who still have to walk for food, for those women who are still on the verge of hunger and starvation. They were able to stand up to billionaires and presidents and prime ministers to put on the brakes that even those in the name of faith would rather not hear the voices of those marginalized. So those women are fighting now and fighting still and will keep fighting. But yes, they do it because, as one told me, Pastor, we know God didn't want the rest of us to suffer. And that's all there is to it. Revolution is about the strength and the capacity to know that God loves our gendered self, that God, she, and God, they would not want a world in which sin were allowed to reign, where empire were allowed to be the rule of the day. And so it takes courage to be like wisdom, running through the streets and wailing when something is wrong. How can these people suffer and no one do anything about it? And it is that collectivity, that ability to transform erasure into power, to transform pain into progress, to shout and cry that God loves me and I am ready for a revolution. 
That's what I think about liberatory women's approaches to scripture, to life, that grandmas and great grandmas and siblings and cousins and all those who came before us have made a way of prayer and praise and song when there should have been no way that this tradition belongs to all of us, even those of us who it was not written for or named in any of the texts. But may the spirit of revolution keep being born out in the Shipras and the Puas and Bathshebas and Abishas and Ruth and Naomi and in every one of us who knows that there's a God who believes that God's people all deserve a right to live and love in liberation. Amen.